Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Welcome to Oklahoma Gardening. Today I've got an annual I want to share with you that's still going strong in the garden. Former host Steve Owens shares his display gardens at Bustani Plant Farms. We learn about some creepy crawlers. And finally, we take a look at a few fall fruits down at Perkins. I just love those annuals that really help transition our spring color all the way into our fall color that will soon be approaching. Now today I want to show you this uh, luscious citron lantana and a yellow lantana is nothing new to the market but what I really love about this is it's more of a butter yellow versus the bright gold yellow that you often see on lantana which makes it a nice complement to such a variety of colors, whether it's that bright spring color um, that you want to complement it with or the softer oranges and reds as we transition into the autumn time. Lantana is a great addition to the garden because it allows that consistency through those seasons. Now, of course, we know that lantana is a nice durable plant and you guys know that I often like to walk through our trial gardens here at the Botanic Garden because a lot of times later in the season you can really start to see which annuals are proving themselves after a tough season. And of course, we've been in a drought and so there are plants that are definitely showing some stress, but this lantana it will stop you in your tracks as you're walking through the trials because you can see here it is a showstopper. It's not proving to have any trouble with our drought conditions or the heat of the summer so far. So this luscious citron lantana is a nice addition to the garden. Of course it continues to provide these flowers, numerous flowers throughout the season without any deadheading and maintains a nice two foot height without any uh, pruning or anything else. So a very low maintenance drought tolerant annual to add into your garden. The other thing to keep in mind while we love the flowers um, visually to be able to see them in our garden, what's nice about this and we often think about it in the springtime is providing nectar for our pollinators. But it's just as important to have those nectar sources available for our pollinators in the fall as a lot of them will be migrating through. So not only do we appreciate those flowers, but the pollinators do as well. Luscious Citron Lantana is a nice annual to add into your landscape to help carry your garden from the spring all the way into fall. Today I'm so excited because we are at Bustani Plant Farm and many of you I know come here quite often in the springtime and I'm so excited to be joined by Steve Owens. Obviously I think a lot of our fans and viewers know you. Um, after leaving the show Oklahoma Gardening though, you came out here and started your own nursery at Bustani Plant Farm. So thanks for having us here. Oh, uh, welcome. Yeah, yeah, thanks for coming out. It's good to be uh, back uh, working with Oklahoma Gardening a bit. Yeah, definitely. Well, and I know how many people come in spring. We all get your plant catalog. We all get Bustani fever to come out here and see and buy in the springtime. But I think sometimes people miss what there is in the fall. So that's why one of the reasons I wanted to come here specifically. Sure. Yeah. So. In, the, in the springtime, we have a lot of variety of plants for sale. There's not a whole lot to see in the garden, but in the fall, it's just the opposite. Yeah. There's not a big variety of plants for sale, but it's a really good time to see the display gardens. And, you know, we, uh, we always want to have something for everybody to see. You know, if, you, if, you, if it's your first time, if you come uh, 
several times. We want to have something new every year. And you always have new plants for sale, but also the gardens are always changing. And that's one of the things that drew me out here. I know, um, to, well, you can tell us a little bit about some of the projects you've done previously. Sure, over the sure. Years. Yeah, yeah. A few years back, we added a rock garden. That's kind of a passion of mine, uh, just gardening with uh, rocks and plants and creating those little mountaintop gardens. Uh, but, but every year we also try to uh, do like maybe a new display with uh, different types of foliage or some other artwork. Uh, we did an entryway uh, structure with the old rusty tin with lots of vines growing up on it. Uh, but last year, one of the cool new things we did is the garden you're standing in. Yes. This, this we call our Waddle Fence Garden, so, W-A-T-T-L-E. Yeah, so it kind of has an English cottage feel to it for me. So can you tell me a little bit about how you constructed this? Sure, sure. I've always been fascinated with these. I, I, I saw my first Waddle uh, structure, I guess, at the uh, Chelsea Flower Show several years ago. And we actually, um, back in 1996, 25 years ago, the very first time I was on Oklahoma Gardening as garden manager, uh, former host Sue Gray and I were uh, constructing a small wattle fence. So they've always uh, been okay. kind of special to me. We might have to find that footage and do a little throwback. <laughs> Absolutely. That'll be, that'll be interesting. But, uh, but yeah, uh, we, we just wanted to do a, a wattle, a few wattle structures in this garden. And basically with the wattle fence, it's, uh, it's just uh, twigs woven between stakes. Okay. So tell me a little bit about the construction. Obviously it looks like your stakes are larger uh, branches um, that you drove down into the ground. Is that what yeah. you do first? Well, yeah, we, we, we did the design. We, uh, we strung out string on the corners and then actually the corner posts here, you can see they're a little bit larger in they're diameter smaller, than these okay. stakes. Uh, we dug these holes with post hole diggers. Okay and we got some nice straight sticks and we, uh, we set them in place and we tamped those in. Now these other smaller stakes, they're like 15, 16 inches apart. Uh, those, we just, we sharpened those with a hatchet, just kind of like sharpening a big pencil, uh -huh. you know? And then we, uh, we, we put our string back up and then we just, we tried to drive those uh, as straight as we could uh, into the ground. Okay, and that's before weaving anything, right? Absolutely, so yeah, get all the, all the stakes in place. Okay. And then uh, you go about searching for the material and it takes a lot <laughs> of material. Uh, we're, we're lucky, we have a forested area here on our property, so we could go out and select uh, different different species of uh, young saplings so th and things th like That's that. what I was gonna ask. Uh, I know a lot of times people will use willow or something that has a little more give to it. Did you find any particular type of wood works better? And does it need to be like wet wood, green wood, you know, like? Good question. Uh, it's it's all types of wood. Okay. Uh, the, the main criteria for us was what was available and what was what was what was narrow and you know not crooked. The the, the straighter the, uh, the the saplings, the the easier it is to get them to uh, to weave into okay. place. But uh, there's stuff in here like uh, rough leaf dogwood. There's hackberry. There's elm. Uh, there's some native grape I was vine. Say it looks a little... uh, yeah, just just basically whatever we could find. Which all just adds texture, right? Yes, <laughs> yes, the different textures of the bark and things like that. And we tried to use it within about two days. Uh, that way, it was still green and pliable okay. uh, because if it sits for a while and gets dry when you're trying to bend it uh, in between uh, weave, weaving it back, basically back and forth between the stakes um, it can snap. It starts to get so, brittle. Yeah. Okay. But the straighter the straighter the better. Well it looks great it's a nice detail to the garden and and it's sort of a raised bed within a raised bed. Um, tell us a little bit it looks like you might have some landscape fabric holding some soil in there. Absolutely yeah um, the uh, yeah it, it is kind of a raised bed on top of a raised bed here in our gardens. I'm a firm believer in raised beds <laughs> creating your own soil but we, we did want to raise the, uh, the the soil level inside the wattles and uh, yeah to keep the soil from spilling through we did put down a, like a double layer of uh, landscape fabric okay and then we just added some compost and uh, uh, soil behind that and uh, the plants are really loving it. So Steve, I mean, it's a beautiful addition to your garden and it sounds like something a homeowner could do. What is the maintenance and how long are you gonna plan to keep this in the garden? Uh, a homeowner could absolutely do this. Uh, now we are hoping to get three seasons out of it. Okay. Uh, anytime you have the soil up against it, you're gonna get little wood boring beetles and uh, 
Yeah, so two or three seasons would be great. If you treat it with something like linseed oil, you may get a few more years out of it. Okay, all right. Well, let's look at some of the plants. If you do. We can't not talk about plants with you. Absolutely. So, yeah. one of the showstoppers here, let's look at this pink flower here. This bright pink thing here that all the little skipper butterflies are all over. This yeah. is a globe amaranth. It's a new one called truffula pink and uh, doesn't make seeds. Okay. You know, some people like having a lot of plants that reseed every year. This one does not, so it's very well behaved. And then we've got some red phosphor vein. Uh, these are one of our, our specialties. We breed these here at the nursery. We have some selections that we've made. And they continue to bloom up this spike all absolutely, season, right? Absolutely, and the, the butterflies and hummingbirds absolutely love them. Yeah, well, I want to know about this guy. Is this a milkweed back here? Very good. That is a giant milkweed, yes. It's, it's not winter hardy, but okay. uh, we love the foliage. Very dramatic, and then those uh, huge lavender purple colored uh, flowers are really uh, something special in the garden. Definitely. Well, I love, again, you've got such an explosion of color here and you've oriented everything so nicely. Any hints as to what you're going to do next year? I don't know. I, uh, I'll have to think about it and see what we can come up with. We always want something new so people will want to come and see us every year. All right. Well, thank you for letting us join you, Steve. It's been a pleasure. We're here at the gardens today because at the insect adventure we get a lot of questions about millipedes and centipedes and what are the difference. So we've brought them out today to have a little talk. Centipede, millipede. So a lot of times because things sound the same, folks are sure that means that they're closely related. But a centipede and a millipede, even though they sound similar, are as different as a shrimp and a spider. So they're very distantly related, but they're both still arthropods. The big difference about between millipedes and centipedes is just about everything. Millipedes are very slow because they do not run to catch their food. They're strict vegetarians. They only eat fruits and vegetables and wood and rotten leaves and that sort of thing. So their bodies are very slow and very chubby. For each segment of the body on a millipede, there are four legs present and absolutely no teeth. And they come in all shapes and sizes and colors. There are hot pink millipedes. There are deepest, darkest jungle millipedes. This is the largest species of millipede in the world. They're from Tanzania over in Africa. And all millipedes are harmless unless you eat them, <laughs> which makes them poisonous. Uh, they are not venomous, they do not bite, they do not have teeth, they don't sting, but if you lick or eat a millipede, it has the capacity to make you throw up. And on the other side of the world, there are some millipedes that if you lick them, they actually can make you drop dead. So don't go licking any millipedes, they can make you sick. On the other hand, a centipede is entirely different. Its body structure is different. It's not round and chubby. It's very flat. And instead of having four legs for each body segment, there are only two legs. And those legs are located on the side of the body to enable the centipede to run really, really fast because centipedes don't eat their vegetables. Centipedes are apex predators. They only eat meat. They're strictly carnivores. And they're big enough carnivores to be able to take down things like mice and lizards and baby frogs and even spiders. Uh, they're really capable of eating anything that is a little bit smaller than their body. Centipedes are considered venomous because they possess venom. Poisonous means has poison, and if you eat it, it makes you sick. Venomous means has venom, 
But neither venomous nor poisonous is the same as deadly. Deadly means it can put you in the hospital. There's no centipede anywhere in the world that is dangerous enough to a person that it does anything more than hurt. There's never been a sickness, a sore, or a death on planet Earth to a human caused by a centipede. They have big bitey fangs, lots of legs, no stingers, and they can bite when they're frightened or disturbed, but they're a beneficial animal to have around your house or in the garden because they're gonna eat other bugs and help keep pests out of your house and home. So if you find a bug in your garden with a lot of legs, even from far away, you can tell whether it's a centipede or a millipede. A lot of legs on the ground, moving very slowly, that's a millipede. And it's not gonna do any danger to you or your garden and just let it go, leave it alone, enjoy it. Centipede, if you see one in your garden, it'll have lots of legs and be lightning fast because it has to catch its food. There's no reason to kill it. Enjoy its beauty and let it go on its way. Today we are here at the Cimarron Valley Research Station to take a look at a few interesting fruits. And joining us today is Becky Carroll. Thanks for having us out here, Becky. Sure. So it looks like we've got some figs that overwinter. Tell us a little bit about the fig in general. Well, figs are kind of a, an interesting plant. These are common figs. And um, they like hot, dry conditions, but they'll, the fruit will size better with a little bit of irrigation. Um, most of the figs that we grow are only hardy to about 17 degrees. So we usually have bushes instead of trees where you might see fig trees in other areas that don't get as cold. We're gonna have more of a bush unless it's been overwintered or protected uh, from the cold. And, and they overwinter in their rootstock, is that yes. correct? So you'll see this die back but regrow? Mm -hmm. Yes, in the winter, all of this tissue will die back to the ground. They'll send up maybe sometimes double the amount of shoots the okay. next season. And they're very slow to come out in the spring. So you think, oh, my fig's dead. <laughs> but they're just waiting for it to get warm enough to actually start, um, start growing. All right, well, it looks like we've got a good uh, crop here. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a little bit about how they uh, ripen as they go All up. All right, so you can see on, on this one shoot, this one stem, they start uh, producing a fruit at each one of these leaf nodes. And so it's pretty neat to see, you know, we have fruit ripening from all the way down to the, the very top. They're very tiny. And these probably won't make it to ripening because uh, once we get to that hard freeze time, this plant is, is done. Okay. But they'll, they'll start ripening in um, late August, early September. And you can see they're very erect. They stand straight up mm -hmm. on, at these leaf nodes whenever they're ripening. But once they get to that stage when they are ripe, they start to droop or hang down. This one could, probably has an, another day or so, but this one on, on this other shoot right here um, is hanging down um, a lot in this one as well. And so they pull off and just very, off in your hand. very yeah. easily, right. And you can see it's kind of dripping this, this white latex substance. Some people are allergic okay. to that. So you need to be careful if you don't know. But it will stop dripping soon. Uh, but the leaf tissue and, and where the, the fruit comes off, it will have that latex substance. And they're not necessarily red, is that true about the ripening? Right, yeah, okay. you can't tell by the color. Some are going to be green when they're ripe. Okay. And so um, some of the different varieties are green, some are brown, some are purple. So there's, it, you can't go by coloring. Okay. Well, with that many on there, I know a lot of times when we're talking fruit trees, we have to kind of thin the crop load. Do uh -huh. you have to do that with these? Or? We don't really thin the fruit on the shoots, but we might go ahead and pinch out the top of these shoots if we want to send more energy into ripening that fruit. Okay. Or you might thin out some of the shoots if they have an abundance of, of new shoots, thin out some of those, maybe leave, you know, 
seven or eight of the, the most vigorous and have those put all the energy into ripening those fruits. Okay, so tell us a little bit about just the maintenance of the plants throughout the season. Best time to plant them, uh, any disease, pest problems? Right. Now, most of the time I recommend planting fruit trees either in the fall or in the spring, about mid-February, early March. Okay. On figs, I like to wait a little bit longer, maybe April, even into May, and avoid those late spring freezes that we get. And so planting is, is pretty simple. Um, we like to make sure that we have them mulched heavily to keep the weeds and the moisture in. and. They don't require a lot of irrigation. They like those hot, dry conditions, but with water, the fruit's gonna size a little bit better. So I think they're pretty adapted. You don't wanna put it in an area that stays too wet, but, uh, but well-drained soil is gonna be better than, okay. than something that's gonna hold too well, much. Well, I think a lot of times we used to think figs only needed a certain microclimate, but it sounds, I mean, they're very exposed out oh, here. Yeah. Um, and again, they survived the, the cool temperatures we had this last right. winter. Any pest problems or deer problems that there are to mention? Well, you can see the leaves are, are really fairly clean. There's not any disease on them uh, that I can see right here, but we had a really wet spring. So you would assume that we were gonna have disease, we would, it would be showing up. So in some areas they report having fig rust, okay. but that's pretty much the only disease that we really have. Now if they get too dry, the leaves will start to yellow and they'll drop them as well. And on some varieties, if they get too dry, dry they'll drop the fruit. So irrigation can help that as well. Okay. But, but not um, like a regular fruit tree that no, definitely needs no, spraying or no, anything No like sprays, that. not anything like you would expect on other fruit trees. And we had a, a deer party in here last no. year about this time, <laughs> and they ate every other or rubbed every other tree out here and left the figs alone. Okay. So Well, I know traditionally when we're talking about figs, we tend to recommend the brown turkey mm -hmm. uh, fig, which I think has some other names as it well. It does, yeah. But You've got a few different varieties out here. Let's talk mm -hmm. about the different varieties. Sure. This one is a is a brown turkey. It's also called Texas Everbearing. Okay. And then we have a LSU Purple, which is the fruit that I've gotten this year. It's shaped a little bit different. It is very dark purple, um, so it, it's a little bit smaller. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if this is characteristic or just this season. And then um, then we have. Uh, Violette de Bordeaux that is a little bit of a, um, has a different leaf shape. It's more of a palmated leaf and uh, the fruit on it is not ripening as well. So I don't know that I'm going to recommend it, but it's one that we're looking at. And actually makes a good uh, foliage plant. It does. I think. It's very pretty. <laughs> All right. So of, of these, they're planted in the ground out here. Mm -hmm. Could somebody grow this in the container if they wanted to? Yes. And, and you can keep them alive through the winter. That way they're not dying back to the ground. You may be able to get a little bit earlier production on them. And so on some figs, they produce a spring fruit that's called a bariba crop. I've never seen those in this area, uh, but you can grow them in containers. Uh, I have some of those big mineral tubs that I've been growing those in and then move them into my storm shelter over the winter. And they, they did great, just kind of go dormant in there. And then after the threat of a freeze, I'll bring them back out and they'll start growing. Uh, some people also will put them like on, maybe on the east side of the house and pile hay or straw or something around them to keep them a little bit warmer as well. So because their roots are exposed, you wanna make sure to protect them a yep. little bit better. That's okay, true. well, and I know just as a last little thing, um, this isn't the only kind of fun fruit you're growing out here. Sure. You're kind of being adventurous and yeah. you've got some pomegranates also. Do you want yes. to tell us a little bit about what you're finding with the pomegranate? We have the uh, Russian Salavatsky pomegranate and it is a hardy uh, pomegranate. They're not going to be the big size that you might find in the grocery store, but we planted them in, um, in the spring of 2020 and they actually flowered that year. I went ahead and let them flower thinking they probably wouldn't survive that season. And uh, they flowered, but the fruit dropped off. Okay. 
This year they had put on two flowers after they went through that minus 14 uh, so they survived. winter. They yeah. survived. They came back out this spring and then they got bit by that late April freeze. And so there was no green tissue on them late April, but they've come back and uh, they have a couple of flowers on them this season. One just aborted this mm -hmm. weekend and the other one is developing into a fruit. So we'll okay. see how long it survives. Um, not something that I really recommend just yet for fruit production, but it's something fun to take a look at. Yeah, it's a fun little novelty yeah. to add to your garden yeah. and, and it's a beautiful flower it too. It is, yeah. All right. Well, obviously fall isn't just for apples. We That's can grow right. a lot of other fruits That's out here. That's true. Thank you so much for sure. sharing this with us, Becca. Uh -huh. There are a lot of great horticulture activities this time of year. Be sure and consider some of these events in the weeks ahead. Next week on Oklahoma Gardening, we have another full show lined up as we take a look at some tropical plants and some wiggly worms. To find out more information about show topics as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure to visit our website at oklahomagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussion on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. Tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater gem. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shops, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, and Tulsa Garden Club. <laughs>